Welcome to the show. It's Chris Graham joined by Rod Mullins. We're going to talk some NASCAR uh, and look back uh, to the uh, playoff race in Fort Worth. William Byron kind of stealing a win for uh, Rick Hendrick uh, and advancing to the round of eight of the NASCAR playoffs. I say stealing the win because the final restart, six laps, six laps left. Uh, he uh, worked his way in front of Bubba Wallace, who'd been leading a lot of that race and streaked his way to victory so big win big win for byron and uh bubba wallace that's one he feels like he let slip from his fingers there yeah that's true but it didn't leave him in bad position i mean he's still up there uh kind of on the borderline with the cut as we get closer to the cut now but still um he kind of held in there that's kind of what surprised me he was holding in there but then it just seemed like when Byron came out of nowhere, uh, there was some jockeying for position right there toward the end of the race. Here come Byron. Uh, and then when Byron came up to the front, Wallace was gone to the back. And, you know, something, I don't know if something happened to the car. Quite not, I'm not quite sure really what happened with it with Wallace. If, you know, it may have been the tires, may have been, he just did not have enough to, uh, to kind of stick with it and be able to hold on to the track with a little bit of grip. But, uh, yeah, it hurt him in the end. Uh, he didn't get the win out of it. But still, um, he's kind of holding his own right now on the point standings as they get ready to go to Talladega. You know, it's interesting thinking about, uh, you know, talking about Bubba Wallace again. Um, he's a guy who's in the playoffs. He made it to the second round of the playoffs. Mm -hmm. um, he hasn't won this year. Uh, he led 111 laps in this race. This was probably his best run of the year. Yeah, I, I think so. I think it was probably his best run of the year. Um, that something, you know, majorly didn't happen about a quarter of the way or halfway through the race. He was there for at least 95 to 98% of the race until the final laps. And, uh, that was a great performance by him. I mean, he's, he's driving the car. Good. Uh, I think he's responding to the pressure right now of what he needs to, uh, there faced with the playoffs and trying to advance, but, um, you know, it's, you know, he, he knows now it's getting tough. It's getting tougher each week. And, you know, this coming week, I think he feels like he's got a good chance at Talladega. Um, uh, you know, the thing at Fort Worth, uh, the drive there at, uh, Texas, not bad. Um, he's not finished too, you know, in perfect and, and very nice situations there at Texas, but, uh, you know, he's hoping for big things coming up at Talladega this weekend. So of the top seven finishers in Fort Worth, six were playoff drivers. Ross Chastain was second, Wallace third, Chris Robel fourth, Denny Hamlin fifth, uh, Kevin Harvick, who's not in the playoffs, was sixth, and then uh, Brad Keselowski was seventh. So, I mean, it's kind of like cream rising to the top. Yeah, that's what it is. And, you know, I think it's kind of interesting, the predictions right now that are being made as who's going to make the cut this next time around or who's going to fall away in this next round of cuts um, right now, the predictions are Kyle Larson. Kyle Larson's not been doing too well, had a wreck, I think on uh, Sunday with this uh, in this race, didn't, did not have a good race. Uh, so Larson is kind of dropping out of everything. Then you've got Ross Chastain. Denny Hamlin wants nothing more than Ross Chastain to be knocked out of the playoffs. Well, I wonder why it has something to do with Martinsville because he wouldn't have made it into Martinsville if he had not performed that move right there on that final lap that could have kept him in, that kept him in to playoff contention. But uh, I think what they're trying to do, I think Hamlin is kind of hinting around that saying, you know, we're going to put track house out. We want to put track house out. We don't want to have, you know, we don't want to have them in here in the mix because a lot of people are going back and saying, you know, Chastain could be kryptonite to him as they go into the the playoff stretch. He could very well advance if he has some good races. Uh, so far, he's hanging there, but you know he's got to really perform here the next few weeks if he's going to stay in contention for this. So I'm noting here that or uh, seeing here that um, this was the 300th victory for the Hendrick Motorsports team. So that's um, yes. That's a round number, a nice milestone for Hendrick and, uh, and kind of a chronicle of all their years of, of success. Yeah, it is. It's it's a compliment to Rick Hendrick, uh, you know, sticking with a particular car manufacturer, as in Chevrolet, for all this time. Uh, you know, some of the great drivers he's had come through there. And, 
you know, really some of them, I mean, I could mention Daryl Waltrip. I could mention Jeff Bodine. Jeff Bodine was actually, I think, the one that got him his first win uh, there that started the ball rolling for Hendrick Motorsports. But, you know, you got to think Jeff Gordon, Jimmy Johnson, you know, there, Dale Earnhardt Jr. when he was there, and uh, he managed to get Dale Jr. to sign with him there for the contract. But, you know, I can't really go without mentioning about Hendrick Motorsports. I don't think they would have gotten on the map if it hadn't been for a guy, an open-wheel driver by the name of Tim Richmond. And I think that that's really what got this program to where it's at today. Not as much Jeff Gordon, not as much Jimmy Johnson, but you have to look to the past in order for this to happen. And unfortunately, Tim Richmond didn't have a chance to, you know, I guess for us to see his glory as to what he could possibly do with a little bit more time in NASCAR due to the, uh, the diagnosis, the, uh, you know, the thing of what he had with AIDS and then uh, also uh, not allowing him to race. I think it was a Daytona race. They uh, NASCAR said, no, not going to let him race and so forth. And I think that kind of hurt him at that point. That was one of those things where he felt beaten, broken out of the whole thing. Hendrick Motorsports was, you know, moving on at that point. They had moved on because of the situation. Uh, but I, I just really feel that Hendrick uh, can't really uh, bask in any kind of sunlight without kind of mentioning that, uh, you know, Tim Richmond was part of that, part of that run. And Daryl Waltrip also. Daryl Waltrip came along. Um, I think he kind of helped out, out a whole lot with Hendrick Motorsports. But, you know, really the telltale sign was early 90s when he signed Jeff Gordon. And when he signed Jeff Gordon, that kind of started the upward trend even more for this race team. And then Jimmy Johnson joining along. Wow. I mean, you had right there, um, you know, what was it? Uh, Jeff Gordon, five-time champion, I believe is what it was, five-time champion, and then Je uh, Jimmy Johnson with seven. So um, you know, it's kind of unreal. It's kind of unreal that they've reached 300, but they've had a lot of ups. They've had a lot of downs. They've had a lot of heartbreak go along through to get to 300. A couple of off-trap notes uh, to talk about before we look at this weekend's race. Um, news uh, about Indianapolis for next year. Uh, NASCAR's, NASCAR is going to return to the Oval for the 30th anniversary of the Brickyard. It's about time. I mean, I'm just going to be honest about it. I really wish um, at first, the first year of this whole thing, I kind of thought, uh, well, I can live with a road course. That's not going to kill me too bad. But it's not the Brickyard. It is not with the... Uh, pomp and pageantry that I got to experience at the first Brickyard race. And that was 94, I believe is when it was sometime around 94. So um, yeah, they've got to get back to basics. That's what they've got to get back to. They've got to find a way in order to bring both the open wheel guys from Indy and also these stock cars uh, kind of together once again and, you know, be able to get these guys in there to where they're going to jam pack this place. And that's what they need to do. I've, I've never forgotten the time that I was at Indianapolis. I was sitting in the paddock. I was sitting in shade, but I'm telling you the, the buzz that was there, um, unlike any other race I've ever been to, even a Bristol race, even though it will stand up, make you patriotic and so forth. Uh, gosh, it was just the thrill of being there for that first, that first race. And then for four or five years after that, you know, it was, it was doing okay, but it started dropping. And I think uh, that one race there uh, through the stretch, and this happened several years ago, the tire debacle. And I think when that happened, uh, a lot of people lost a lot of confidence in the brickyard. And um, I think it's only fair that they get this chance back. And maybe with Roger Penske's uh, guidance direction, I think they've got something if they can just really uh, strike while the iron's hot. Keeping the news with historic venues, uh, NASCAR announcing, I think this is as of today, mm -hmm. that the all-star race is going to remain at North Wilkesboro after this year's race, the first NASCAR race there in 27 years. Uh, so that's big. The million dollar race is going to stay in North Wilkesboro. Yeah, there were a lot of questions about this. They were talking about this at Bristol. We were in the media center and the schedule hadn't been released yet. And a lot of people were asking the question. I was talking to a podcaster and he asked me, he said, what did I think of the chances of NASCAR possibly going back to North Wilkesboro? And I said, I think they're good. I think they're really good. And 
then he and I started talking. He went to the all-star race and he said that it was for lack of a better term, pandemonium. It wasn't that the racing was bad or anything. It was just, there were so many limited media spots that were available that you could go to this and see it. Why is my phone going off during the middle of a podcast? I have no <laughs> idea. But anyway, um, I didn't understand why at first. And then he told me, said, you know, limited seating, limited arrangements and so forth. I think that may be changed around by this time uh, next year. You know, when they get ready to run this all-star race, I think there'll be some more changes. But I don't think there's going to be any major changes, per se, of where we end up going with a, uh, oh, we're going to have a 500-person media center. I don't think that's going to be. This is still, uh, you know, one of these revered meccas when it comes to Southern grassroots racing. And I think they're going to keep it that way. I don't want I don't think they're going to let it get out of head and, and go to, you know, 50,000, 100,000 seating or anything like that. They want to preserve that short track atmosphere and make this a very special event. So yeah, it's going to be back. Um, we kind of talked a little bit uh, more about is Rockingham going to be back? Um, a lot of people asking that question um, right now. Don't know if Rockingham is going to be back. I think according to what I heard, they've run out of money. Uh, they've got this thing of where they've been able to open the track up or get the track and be able to do some things at it. But as for what it needs to have a NASCAR race back, uh, they're kind of lacking right there. And this special COVID funding or whatever that North Carolina came up with, North Wilkesboro, they got their share of it, but Rockingham didn't get as much as they needed. Or for that matter, they got some, but they have just run out from where they're at. So we'll kind of be waiting on that. And then, of course, the news is uh, we have already talked about it. No dirt at Bristol, but two concrete races there at Bristol uh, Motor Speedway for 2024. So back on uh, the 2023 playoffs uh, race, we have two races left in this round to get from 12 to 8. Rod mentioned Talladega's this weekend, of course, the Charlotte Road Course, the Roval, coming up on October 8th. So let's look ahead at Talladega, Rod. Uh, we had uh, we already had William Byron uh, punch his ticket to the next round. Um, mm -hmm. Who do you think runs well here? And, you know, given what we've seen the last few weeks, uh, who would you be looking to be in the – you know, in the running here in the last few laps to to maybe advance uh, from this weekend? I think Chris Busher punches his ticket. Uh, they had, uh, they've had a great run, uh, especially on some of the super speedways. Um, I think he even won a, a super speedway race uh, at one time here in the, here in the last year, he's won one of those big super speedway races. So he's got a chance. I think he's one of those you need to look out for. Um, if, if we talk about any of the Toyotas or anything, I'm have yet to see if the Toyotas are going to really rise to the challenge on this. This is going to be the, the track that really tests them because it's been mostly a Chevrolet dominated sort of thing when they go to Talladega. And then you've had some people that's come and they've up and surprised some people. You'll get a Ford in there that'll win or a Toyota that will run close to the front. Toyota needs to have a good performance this time around. And I think they need to have that at Talladega. Um, I'll tell you another one that is desperate for a win right now. And some people might think, no, you can't be talking possibly about him. I'm talking about Kyle Busch. He needs a win here and he needs one pretty quickly. Um, he had some bad luck. Uh, he got some fines. There were some fines this past weekend, Richard Childress racing from the Texas race and also one of the truck series race. Um, he's wanting to go to this race and he's also wanting to punch that ticket into the playoffs that next round and do so well, because this past week he sold his control and everything of Kyle Busch motorsports and the, and the truck series over to Spire Motorsports. Now, that was a big thing because a lot of people thought that he was going to go and he was going to have Kyle Busch Motorsports ready for his son that was coming up through the ranks, racing on those little uh, smart or those little midget cars that he likes to race. Uh, but that's not what's going to happen. Uh, rumor has it, the story goes that um, Kyle Busch may be at a point where if he's going to do something, he may be entering into an agreement with Richard Childress to have part of that race team, uh, you know, at least contribute uh, so much. And then Richard Childress 
pull back. And by the time that he pulls back, Kyle Bush may be running the operation before it's over with. And then Richard Childress overseeing things that's kind of up in the air, but that's a rumor that's going around right now. So getting back to this about Kyle Bush, he wants desperately to know uh, that he's got a chance at getting this, uh, getting that car into the winter circle there at Talladega and also making sure that, Hey, I'm getting ready to make some decisions on some things. I've already made one decision. I want to make sure that I make the right decision. That's going to put me in the winter circle and punches my ticket to the next playoff. And I, you know, I think that's what's going to happen. He's got to have a good race this coming weekend. Richard Childress racing has been good at Talladega in the past. So many competing things going on, your business interests, your racing interests, all, all coalescing uh, at this time of year. So interesting to, to hear all that talk well rod as always thank you for your time and your insight we look forward to talking again again next week appreciate it chris thank you